All right, welcome back, everyone. Yeah, we're about to start. Okay, it's with glad, uh, great pleasure to um, be the chair for this last session of this um, fantastic conference. And, um, oh yeah, more people are coming in, that's great. Because at first, I, we were wondering, I was wondering whether the topic of geometry is going to be <laughs> At least the title is going to be quite daunting for people who have uh, maths phobia, uh, as uh, mentioned by Professor Yang earlier. Um, well, um, let me introduce the first speaker. Well, it's a, his name is up there, Rick Cohn. Um, I guess he needs uh, no introduction to people who are, are into mathematics in music. Um, he is the uh, Bartel uh, Professor of Music at um, Yale University, as well as the, um, at the uh, Sydney Conservatorium of Music. And he is also the founding editor of the book series, Studies in Music Theory. Um, and actually, he's, uh, he and our second speaker, uh, Dimitri uh, Timoshko, have also published uh, many books on this series. Uh, he is also the executive um, editor of the Journal of Music Theory. Oh, was. All right, was. And so with, um, let, let me welcome, let us welcome uh, Professor Cohn on stage to deliver his first presentation. I don't need to lean into the mic, do I, to be heard? Everybody good? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, let me start by giving a sincere thanks to the organizers of the conference. It's, it's a really wonderful conference. I've been delighted to be here, and even more delighted to have been asked to contribute. Uh, now, when I received the invitation uh, to do this talk, I was asked to talk about um, geometry and also graph theory as it applies to music. And so I'm going to take geometries, plural, to mean something broader than geometry uh, in, in its most narrow sense. Um, I take the distinction, and Dimitri and I have been, have been uh, talking about this, I take the distinction between, to be more or less this. Um, so when we have a graph, we have a set of points and a set of binary relations between those points which we visualize using edges or line segments. Not yet geometry. Geometry uses plump points. Geometry does more than use line segments. It uses lines that go off into infinity. So that's one of the things you need in order for a geometry. Now we can take those line segments and coordinate them. And if we line them up according to some generative principle, we can then project out into infinity and then infinity and we're now one step closer to geometry. Think, for example, of a, a Cartesian coordinate system or Cartesian grid. Now, but we, there's one more thing that we need, which is that in a Cartesian grid, we have points. And so the, law, the axes are punctuated. Let's say it's a number line, integer line. We have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, on both of the axes. And so we think of the axis as punctuated. Uh, but we don't have, if we're just doing integers, we have no values that occupy the spaces in between the points. Once we start ascribing value to those internal spaces, I think it's safe to say we're, we're, taught we're in the realm of geometry proper. So having made that distinction, I'm not going to fuss a whole lot about it. I'm going to show you some graphs. I'm going to show you some graphs that have axes and dimensionality. And I'm going to show you some graphs that are embedded in geometries proper. And that will set up Dimitri's uh, presentation, I think, because uh, Dimitri's work uh, is the, mo the most sophisticated work that I will present that actually is geometry. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take you a little bit into Dimitri's world um, if I have time. Um, so, points. What do they represent in music? Well, they can represent a pitch. They can represent a point in time. They can represent a pitch 
and a point in time taken together, we call that a note. They can represent a set of pitches that all have the same name. We call that a pitch class. That's somewhat more abstract. Any of those keys will do to represent D. So we might have, a, uh, say, a circle of fifths where D just occupies one node. And we're talking about the pitch class D. Because, yeah. Um, or we might more abstractly not be talking about D, but talking about the function D serves as do or tonic. We can make a similar move in the realm of time points. We can collect time points together that have a similar function, say, in a time cycle. So the point of renewal of the time cycle, we might call it the downbeat, or uh, in, in, in Indonesia, the gong, or in India, the tom. So um, that's not a particular point in time, but uh, an equivalence class of points in time. Now, we can get more abstract than that. We can use points to represent keys, which are somewhat more abstract than simply pitch classes. We can use points to represent meters. We can point, uh, use points to represent durational spans. OK, so what do edges do? Well, the edges do an awful lot of different things. But the, obviously, they're going to represent binary relationships. So they might represent a particular musical distance. They might represent an inclusion relationship or a relationship of complementation. Um, they might represent maximal intersection and so forth. That's just a few of the things that edges can represent. OK, so now my talk is what is geometric about music. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I do want to touch it briefly. Um, I, I, oh, it's a little early. Um, the um, question is not well formed. I hope some of you recognize that, that music cannot be directly ge geometric. So music is made up of sound. And it's hard to think of, um, we can think of points of sound. And we can think of waves of sound, but it's hard, for example, to think about um, you know, uh, Euclid's third postulate uh, right, having to do with the radius of a circle. What, how does sound participate in that? Well, it, it may be in some way, but um, it's not all that clear. Um, so the better question is one about representation, something that came up in Gene Bamber's and Berger's talk very, uh, a couple of hours ago. So, the question is, what is it about music that invites music theorists across the ages to consistently turn towards modes of graphic representation? And also has invited composers to use graphic resources as a stimulus to the musical imagination. And the first thing to say is probably too obvious to mention, and that is that music flows in time, and we want to capture it. Again, this is something Gene Bamberger Banger was talking about. Um, I think a lot about this wonderful quote from the American um, 19th century uh, philosopher and writer Ralph Waldo Emerson talking about nature, but you could substitute music. The method of music, who could ever analyze it? That rushing stream will not stop to be observed. We can never surprise music in a corner, never find the end of a thread, never tell where to set the first stone. Well, we can do those things with music, but first we have to represent it on a page. Or represent it in some way, I suppose we could represent it with, with three-dimensional objects and so forth. But visualizability is not itself sufficient to explain why music responds to graphic translation. There are some properties of music that lend themselves quite easily to geom geometry and others such as uh, so pitch and duration. Timbre less so. The crucial property that pitch and time possess is strict total ordering. Given two distinct time points, one is always earlier, one is always later. And that relationship is transitive, which is uh, what you need for, for total strict ordering. And we can say the same thing about pitch, given any two pitches that are distinct. One is higher and one is lower. Um, the high and low are metaphors that we choose to use in our culture. Uh, we're, we're so comfortable with them that they seem natural, but other cultures map that total strict ordering onto other things in life. For example, flat and sharp in the ancient Greeks, grave and duris, right? And of course, we, have, we talk about things being flat and sharp, uh, but only in a very local way. Uh, in the Amazon, they might talk about, this note is young, this note is old. Old and young, totally strictly ordered. 
or uh, high notes uh, are, might, might be thought of as, as skinny notes and low notes as plump ones. Uh, some cultures in the South Pacific, I understand, who talk about pitch in that way. But what they all share, of course, is against uh, total ordering. So now, since time and pitch are both strictly ordered, they can be modeled as axes, and their combination can form a Cartesian grid. And this can be used to model particular musics, for example, this. Anybody know what this is? There you go. Good, good, good. You know how to read music. There are more elaborate um, mappings of, of um, pitch and time on Cartesian grid. I don't know if any of you have run into Stephen Malinowski's um, uh, web. Just type his name in. It's a treat. He um, has some really beautiful uh, animations. I, I wasn't able to get it up on the web and probably don't have the time to, but I recommend just checking out his animation of the Chopin Berceuse. It, 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 it uses colors, but you know, it's, it's spatial um, coordinates are, as, as, I, as far as I can tell, uh, a, a Cartesian coordinate system. So, you know, what we're talking about really is something pretty close to our standard notational system which is strictly ordered in terms of time. Every event that's earlier comes to the left of every event that's later on the right, given that we do carriage returns, right, to, for new systems. And pretty much from low to high, but there are some problems. Which, which of these notes is higher, right? Okay. So it's, it's sort of a stylized um, two-dimensional grid. So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to introduce some less familiar and more abstract ways of using mostly two-dimensional grids to build maps of musical relationships. Here's the first one, destylized standard notation. I'm going to talk, this is sort of, sort of table contents for the rest of the talk, about axes, uh, um, coordinate systems in which pitch is represented on both axes. Crantor's lambda from 100 BC, uh, sorry, 400 BC. He was, I think, second generation after Plato. Nicomachus' triangle, about 100 years after, uh, in, the, in the Common Era. Torque-sized triangle from the 14th century. Cones, ski hill graphs, that's me. These last two are time by time. And then I'm going to finish up with a bunch of pitch-by-pitch -pitch graphs, which are all interrelated. In fact, they all build historically on each other, starting with Euler's tone nets, Euler being one of the really monumental figures in the history of mathematics, but he was also a really important music theorist. Um, Elaine Chu's helix, I'm just going to touch on because she, she exposed it very well the other day. Um, a torus, which um, I'm attributing to David Bulger, but it's really the animation that, that Bulger created. That we've known about the torus for a while. Um, Jack Douthat's uh, cube dance, and then I'm going to finish with uh, Dimitri's orbifolds. Then you'll see that these, how they build on each other. Okay, so starting out now with Crantor's lambda. So a little bit of background, and this picks up on uh, Monsieur Bourguignon's talk the other day. He was talking about the, the Pythagorean problem which is you've got octaves, which are two generated, and if you have a single fundamental, all of the octaves are exponential, two to the n. And then you have perfect twelfths, which are compounded perfect fifths, and they are all three to the n, and because three is odd, two is even, they're never going to meet. Okay? And this problem is, if anybody has, knows anything about musical tuning, this is the first thing you learn about tuning, and you know, this is underlaying the problem of musical tuning for more than, longer than we can remember. So uh, Plato was very interested in this problem um, as, as a basis for, for example, his, his system of political theory, how to reconcile the irreconcilable. Uh, and that's not something I feel qualified to talk about. But um, Crantor was one of Plato's disciples, and he created this figure. So having the powers of two going off this way and the powers of three that way, and what's nice about it is that it's not a geometric figure per se, but it does take advantage of one of our intuitions about geometry, which is that two lines on a plane 
that are non-parallel only intersect in one place, right? And so those lines are never going to intersect again. And of course, we can project them back in the other direction. They'll never intersect back that way either. Nicomachus filled it in, essentially treating um, Cranter's lambda as a multiplication table. And so what we have here, these numbers represent the combinations of some number of octaves and some number of perfect fifths. And this figure shows up in a lot of medieval treatises. Uh, it was taken over by a, a French theorist in the 15th century, Nicolas Dorem. 15th, no, sorry, 14th century. Nicolas Dorem, he called it the échequier. And Do Nicolas Dorem was uh, in the same circle as Philippe de Vitry, who is known as the uh, father of mensural notation and the Ars Nova, real, one of the most important revolutions, certainly in musical notation and also in the history of music. And so, um, What's distinctive of a men, about mensular, or excuse me, mensural notation is that it allows you to project, use meters to project more than two metric levels at once. Okay. So up to that point, you could do da 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 da. There's a pulse. Or da 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 da. But you couldn't project slower pulses. And mensural theory allows you to climb the metric hierarchy. And so um, another guy who evidently is in this circle is a German named Johannes Torkezai, who we don't know anything about other than the treatise that he produced. And he produced this triangle. Uh, my former colleague Thomas Christensen sent me this and said, Rick, I think you'll be interested in this one day. And um, what Torkezai does is essentially do a metric, or sorry, rhythmic interpretation of Nicomachus's triangle, right? So each of these notes, the two is a note that has a durational value of two units, the six is a note that has a durational value of six units, and so forth. And we can take torque size triangle to, to um, indicate just the relationships among the durational values. It's a good thing to know, you know, half note divides into two and yet into quarter notes and so forth. But we can take it to re represent something else too, which is we can take each of those nodes as generating, we need more than one pulse for a meter. So we can take that quarter note um, node and think of it as yet, da, 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 that pulse, which we assign a quarter note to. And what that allows us to do is explore something about the metric possibilities in mensural, theory, uh, mensural music. So let's say, for example, that we have this very long note, and we are able to divide it in two different ways. We can divide it into three or divide it into two. So let's say we divide it in three, and divide it that in three again, and we divide that in two, we divide that in three, we divide that in one. Okay, so that's one path, sort of, it's like a mountaineer finding a way up. And you can see that there are lots of different ways that one could get up from that slowest value to that fastest value. Some of them are very close to the one we just did, some of them are far, and so we can take this as a sort of basis for constructing a map of mensural meters. Uh, I, I've done work, this is me, um, independently before, this is why Thomas thought I'd be interested in this, because I, I worked this thing up before I ever knew about uh, yeah, talk site. Um, in his triangle, but I'm interested, I was interested in music of the late 19th century and metric ambiguity, such as no one was just doing his wonderful piece that he played for us, uh, metric uh, dissonance, and how composers like Brahms and Dvorak and Schumann move between different meters. So you can use something like this as follows. Let's say you have a, a constant quarter note beat, and it divides into a constant half note beat and a constant dotted hole. So maybe we're in 6-4 meter, okay? Oh, no, sorry, I guess we would be in 3-2 meter here, right? And then we can divide the quarter note into tripleted eighths and into tripleted sixteenths. All of the duple divisions are on that axis, triple divisions on this axis. And so we might have a piece that combines these pulses. And at a different point, 
the composer might decide to substitute that pulse. And now we have a new path, which we would think of as being in hemiola with the previous path, or he might have them go on at the same time in which we'd get a kind of three against two rubbing, or we might have a quite different path with a bunch of conflicts happening all at the same time. So we can use this to, to, to map the metric terrain. Uh, and uh, it helps us to, because, frankly, we don't, even, we don't know how to talk about meter as an element of musical form, right? That's a real lacuna in, in the way that we talk about music. Okay. Um, how, am I, how am I doing for, for time? I, did, I forgot to check what time I started. Am I about 15 minutes in or? Okay, okay, that's where I was hoping to be. So this is more or less the second half of my talk and it's all about pitch by pitch. And I'm gonna start with um, Euler's tone nets. So going back to Krantor's lambda, Euler's not interested in the octaves. Octaves really don't do anything, okay? We're interested in pitch classes so we wanna sort of mod out the octave but he was interested in major thirds. He was interested in just intonation, which has to do with coordinating pure perfect fifths with pure major thirds, and so he was interested in the relationship between the powers of three and the powers of five, because a major third is, is, is a five to four ratio. So he created a figure that was essentially a multiplication table of the powers of three and the powers of five. And I'm gonna show it to you not using numbers, but just using, using pitch class names, so we'll start with C. And there's one axis. Everything is a pure perfect fifth. And you can imagine it's gonna go on in sharp land that way and into flat land that way. And we can cross that with a set of major thirds, okay? And I, I've been very careful how I spell them, okay? So we get quickly into strange things, multiple flats and multiple sharps. But of course we know that really after three iterations we come back, uh, we want to honor that equivalence and, and I'll, I will talk about what happens when we start honoring that equivalence in a couple of minutes, but right now I, don't, I, I want to dishonor it. So now we can fill in the grid. So there's one strip of major thirds and another one and so forth and so forth and so forth. And now we have a full uh, Cartesian, Cartesian grid. Now, we can add another diagonal going the other way, there, okay? And what are we showing there? Well, we're showing a perfect fifth minus a major third, which is a minor third, okay? And so now all of a sudden, at least in the center of the diagram, we have these triangles. And because those triangles represent only consonant intervals, the triangles represent major and minor triads, and we have then major and minor triads all the way up and down. And once we add all the other parallel axes, we have major and minor triads all over the place. So essentially we're tiling the two-dimensional plane into major and minor triads. And now, um, what I want to do now is derive Euler's tone nets, but from a complete, well, from a quite different set of assumptions. So, let's say we don't care about tuning, right? Uh, just intonation, equal temperament, it all, you know, that's it, fine. But we are interested in a certain kind of relationship among chords. And that relationship is maximal common tone preservation, maximal cardinality intersection from a set theoretical point of view. So let's say that that's our chord. Let's say maybe C major, it doesn't matter. And how many places can we go that maximally intersect? That is, keep two out of three. Well, we have as many places to go as we have edges to the triangle. So we can go these three places, right? And now let's say we want to move out from there, again, keeping two common tones. We can go to these places and then to these places and so forth. And we can build out and what we create is Euler's tone nets if we keep going. But we're going to give it a different interpretation in terms of tuning. And this allows us to make maps of certain kinds of pieces that favor common tone preservation. Uh, a, a map, uh, one, one of these maps, uh, Gérard Assayeg uh, showed one briefly, I think one of his dissertation students, 
uh, works on this. So, for example, um, here's a, a, let's just say a harmonic scheme for a long passage from a Bruckner symphony. It's not going to sound like Bruckner or, or even like music, but I, I couldn't play the whole passage. As I say, you know, each chord gets one of these sort of klangflesh or sound sheet things and goes on for 10 seconds, and then he goes to another chord. Okay. And it's going to travel that path. Oops. Let's, let's turn this up. That's not loud enough. Um, yeah, I can get this. Okay, this may be too loud. Let's see. There I am. See, we're walking across and then jump down there. And we modulate it up a whole step and then another whole step. So we can do this model, make maps of all kinds of music, um, especially from the 19th century, which, which favored uh, common tone preservation at the expense of you know, tonic definition a lot of the time. Um, Moreno was just playing us a piece that uh, did a lot of common tone preserving. Okay. So now let's talk about what happens when we do honor and harmonic equivalence. So we have this plane, this, this plane that goes on forever, but we're not interested in going way off the map here. All we really need is the 24 triads, 12 major and 12 minor, okay? And here they are. So there's six of them there, and another six, and another six, and the last six, okay? So now, let's try to map the Bruckner uh, passage or progression on this. So we start on F minor. Okay, and notice we've jumped off the map into no man's land, right? So what do we do? Well, we take advantage of the fact that the lower corner and upper corner on the left side are the same thing. So we're going to wrap around. Essentially, we're turning the plane into a cylinder. And we're going to move these guys up here. And there's our D major triad. But our G minor triad is still off the map. What do we do now? Well, the left and the right edge meet up. Okay? So we have a cylinder that way as well. And so we travel it over there. And now we have our path looking like this. Okay. And the next part. So starting from that G minor, we have to recuperate those triads to the grid. And so you see we get into some pretty reticulated kinds of things. And so it, it, it begins to be heuristically difficult to travel this map. So when we have these two cylinders, one in this direction and one in that, we have a particular kind of topological figure. This is the same thing. This is Euler's graph, but with the enharmonic correspondences, or at least some of them, not all of them, um, bound together. So this is actually the space we've been traveling, or a sort of truer representation of it, if we assume enharmonic equivalence. Um, I wasn't able to, it's very hard to, to, to map the Bruckner piece onto that, so I, I, I gave up pretty quickly. Um, this is just a little aside. Um, Elaine Chu's spiral array also takes the planar tone nets, um, but does something else with it. So she maps, she, she wraps it into a cylinder on one dimension, but declines to, to, to wrap it from, from end to end. So she allows the flats to go down and the sharps to go up. And what's interesting um, from the point of view of the distinctions I made uh, early on is the way Elaine uses this is as a genuinely um, a, a geometric space because it's a continuous surface. And she's interested, when she's finding these berry centers, the, 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 um, the, she's found a way of interpreting the spaces in between the, the, the tones to represent proximity to tonics and so forth. As I say, I'm not going to talk anymore because Elaine already has done that. So uh, now. Um, what I want to do now is give yet a third interpretation of Euler. And that is 
as a voice leading proximity. So what we want to do is not only have two common tones, but we want the moving voice to move in a small uh, 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 an amount as possible, so a semitone. So can we do that? Well, from C major to E minor, yeah, we can. C goes to B, right? The other two voices stay the same. From C major to C minor, E goes to E flat. From C major to A minor, G goes to A. That's not a half step, OK? So we have no more use for that A minor triad. These are, this is what we have left. And now if we project outward, we're going to just build along here and have this strip. And since we're honoring an harmonic equivalence, this is essentially a, ne a necklace that clasps right there. Okay. So you can think of, of, of a, um, it is cyclical underlying. And now going back to our tone nets, we can see that there are four such strips. Okay. So the points where the strips are attached, they're no longer attached there because we're not honoring those relationships. They require a whole step motion, and so we can separate them out from each other. Now we have these four little islands. And how do we get them to communicate to each other? Well, in order to do that, we need some uh, harmonic object that we can move in and out of by only one motion of half step. And a really good candidate is, oh, sorry, that's just to show that, that it's cyclical, is augmented triads, okay? They're kind of stepping stones between the strips. And the one at the right is duplicated at the left. So again, we're closing up the, the necklace or bracelet, okay? And a version of this is uh, that that's cube dance. Uh, I'll show you how it's a cube by doing a little transformation on it. I'm just going to run through this. You'll, this may seem a little mysterious to you, but so this is cube dance. And what Douth has done is taken each of the triangles and just uh, exchanged it for a point. Okay, a geometric dual is, is what a geometer would say. It's a geometric dual of that. And so we have the same thing with the exception that the top right and bottom left are going to link up. So you see how these make the form of a cube. And that's the six triad cycle that we were looking at. And then here are three more, OK? And those are all minor triads. And because the major triads are higher, those are all major triads. And in between, we have the augmented triads. OK, and now I'm going to get to Dimitri's work a little bit. Now, what Dimitri figured out, we, if we look at this, it, it's, a, it's certainly a graph. It's hard to see what the axes are on this graph. What Dimitri was able to visualize is that there are actually axes underlying this, and moreover, that there, that, uh, he, there is a continuous space so we can, we can uh, give value to the points in between. So now we're, we're into geometry. And let me just talk a little bit about some of the properties of Dimitri's orbifold, because the geometry is, is of an orbifold. So here's one of these cubes. It's got eight points, of course. And up at the upper right, we have one augmented triad. And down at the bottom left, another one that's a half step lower. And in between, we have three major and three minor triads. And Dimitri observed that all of the motions from the top, top to the bottom involved a pitch class motion from C to B. All of the motions, so those are all C to B. All of them, and, and so he said, okay, if that's the case, then the whole top face represents C, and the whole bottom face represents B. Does the same thing with the, the uh, back to front faces. They all represent A flat to G. So again, there's the A flat face becomes moving forward a G face. And then the sideways motions are E to D sharp. So again, we have that. Okay. So now if we put that back into the whole larger figure, we get this. So there's the C plateau. And it goes down to B, which goes down to B flat, which goes down to A, which goes down to A flat. And now what happens? Have we got to the bottom of the figure? Well. What happens is that A flat actually is up 
here. So there's been some strange folding and twisting going on. We move forward to G natural, to F sharp, to F natural, to E natural, and then we do it again. This time we're going to be traveling along the side face from right to left, E, E flat, D sharp, D, C sharp, and now we're back to C. Okay, so that is an arbifold. What Dimitri does, um, do I have a couple more minutes or should I stop? Sorry, stop. Okay, yeah, okay, good. I've taken you a little bit into Dimitri land and that was my intention, so I, I finished.